Okay, we're fashionably late, but I'm also somewhat waiting for people to grab something to eat if they want it now and to take a seat, but I can start talking um, so that I honor those people who are waiting for us to start too. Uh, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Kathy Ansel. I'm the director of the Innovations in Healthy Aging Strategic Initiative at the University of Arizona. I am very, very proud and pleased to have this position. I want to give you a little bit of background on the Innovations in Healthy Aging Initiative before we get started with Dr. Virginia Sturm, who is going to be talking about Big Smile, Small Self, Effects of Awe on Healthy Aging. So some fast facts. The increase in the number of Americans age 65 and older has outpaced the growth in the working age population. Those 65 and older were the fastest growing demographic between 2009 and 2019, increasing 34.2% nationally, so the percentage of older adults relative to younger people. Um, increased 34.2% nationally. But in Arizona, think about this, 48.4% increase during that decade. More than 1.3 million people in Arizona are 65 years of age and older. That's 18% of the state's population. And that is a higher percentage than in other parts of our nation. The primary aim of this um, strategic initiative is to influence the critical factors that affect the health of the aging population. And so how are we going to do that? In 2019, we started talking about what the strategic priorities in the state of Arizona should be. And definitely aging is a strategic priority for the state. So how could the university respond to these needs? We decided that we needed to create an age-friendly university in Arizona at the University of Arizona. And what does that mean? That means we want you to be part of the university and we want to be in the community working with you. Um, we want the university to respond to your needs. We want you to come in for events. We wanna go out. Um, we had a wonderful opportunity, I think with the pandemic to really make so many of our programs virtual. We also wanted to partner with developers of senior living communities and age, aging industry experts to reimagine senior living and aging in place. So we wanted to be to share our scholarship with people who are involved in developing um, both uh, technology and communities for older adults. We also wanted to expand our capacity in research and discovery focused on aging. And we've been doing this with a number of seed grant funding um, announcements and availabilities for our, our, our research faculty. And we wanted to increase the workforce to meet both the opportunities and the challenges of an aging population. So these are the folks that are part of the leadership team. I can tell you that they have been by my side and by Anissa Westcott's side from the beginning. Um, Esther Sternberg is on your left as you're looking at the screen. Um, Esther is the endowed, Andrew Wild Endowed Chair for Integrative Medicine at the Center of Integrative Medicine in the College of Medicine. And Dr. Mindy Fain, who's the co-director of the Arizona Center on Aging and also um, the head of uh, geriatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. She's currently also interim chair of the internal medicine division. So she has quite a few tasks, but she has been um, incredibly supportive in helping this initiative take hold. Um, I also wanted to give you a heads up on innovations in healthy aging lecture series that's come that is part of what you're being uh, participating in today. The next talk will be on aging and social justice uh, that will be on October 19th. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the talks that we've had in the past in the spring are available on our website. 
Um, and I wanted to give one other shout out uh, while I have the mic, and that is to Dr. Michael Dake and to the uh, to the office of the senior vice president of the University of Arizona Health Sciences, who have been incredibly supportive in getting this initiative off the ground and in creating it. And in that time, I, I know you came to hear Virginia, um, and Dr. Uh, Jenny Gubner, who's an ethnomusicologist and chair of the Applied Intercultural Arts Research Graduate Interdisciplinary Research and assistant professor in music at the Fred Fox School of Music will be introducing our speaker. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out despite the weather. It's not raining yet. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Sturm. Dr. Sturm um, has a PhD and is the John Douglas French Alzheimer's Foundation Endowed Professor at UCSF. She is an Associate Professor in the Departments of Neurology and Psychiatry and the Director of the Clinical Affective Neuroscience Laboratory. After her undergraduate work at Georgetown University, she received her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of California, Berkeley and completed her clinical internship and postdoc fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco in neuropsychology. Her research focuses on identifying the neural systems that support emotion and social behavior and neurodegenerative disease and neurodevelopmental disorders. I am so happy to have Dr. Sturm here. I know her from San Francisco, um, um, from the Global Brain Health Institute that I was a part of, and we have been working to bring her here for a long time um, that was delayed a bit by the pandemic. And so it is so wonderful to have her with us. Welcome, Dr. Sturm. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. It's an honor to um, be here today. Here. Um, in this beautiful new building and this beautiful city, which I've never visited before. So it's lovely to be here. Um, as Dr. Gubner mentioned, I study emotions, and I'm going to be talking to you about some of the research that I've done on certain kinds of emotions, particularly the emotion of awe. Um, in, in our healthy aging populations. So before I get into that though, um, studying emotions isn't the most common thing to do even in the field of psychology, let alone in the field of neurology. Uh, but I like to point out that studying emotions actually is quite an old endeavor and we call the field of emotion affective science. Um, but Charles Darwin actually wrote a book about emotions that's less well known than his other more popular famous book on the origins of species, but what he really observed in this book was that humans share different features of behavior as different animals and different species. So sometimes we feel like our dogs might look happy when they're um, panting and happy to see us or um, a cat when they look afraid. There are some similarities between the facial expression and the, of the cat and the behavior of the cat as we might feel when we feel afraid. So this made um, Darwin kind of think about the fact that emotions just like all sorts of other behaviors and areas of cognition might have shared um, biological origins across species. And we've come a long way from the time of Darwin and thinking about what emotions are, but I can tell you that in our field, there's still a lot of debate about what emotions even are. And um, I'm happy to talk about that in, in later on, but I'm going to offer um, a definition that I use in my work just to guide our studies because you know, when you study something as slippery as an emotion, you have to be careful to really define it and then to study, to measure what you're defining. So in this view of emotions, uh, emotions are very short-lived. They're brief, um, just phenomenon that lasts just a few seconds. These little bursts of activity that kind of disrupts you from this homeostasis that you're all sitting quietly and listening right now. Um, and if something happened really quickly, someone ran to the door and started yelling, we'd all look over there and maybe have a a very rapid emotion that happens very quickly and often is in, in this unbidden fashion. And emotions have multiple components associated with them. So they have 
psychological components, and they also have physiological components that unfold when we have an emotion. So for example, um, your attention might shift to the door. In that example, someone running through the door or yelling, um, certain behaviors might become more likely than others. We might want to run away or duck or you know, stand up. Um, you might have certain memories or thoughts that come to mind, maybe a similar situation, maybe another time you might have felt afraid or anxious might pop into your head. And we think that emotions, what they're doing is that they serve to organize the body's physiology in order, so, in order that we can um, deal with that situation really quickly without having to do much thought. So each emotion is important and serves a function, and that's why it evolved. So there's lots of different emotions. And again, this kind of area is um, up for debate as to what we wanna uh, carve out as an emotion per se, but this is just a um, brief list of examples of kind of stereotypical situations where one might feel specific emotions. And um, in each of these kind of stereotypical situations, these are the emotions that we might expect. So in that threat example, someone at the door, we might feel afraid. Um, if you see something rotten um, and you don't want to eat it, you might feel disgust. Um, and then there's some other positive emotions where we feel love or amusement when we're spending time with loved ones. Um, Self-conscious emotions are at the bottom here. These are the different families. Um, um, embarrassment is a really interesting self-conscious emotion. These are a little more complicated emotions that we experience in social contexts. So to have a self-conscious emotion, you have to have a real or an imagined other person. So you have to have someone in your head evaluating you, or you have to be in front of someone. And so embarrassment, for example, um, unfolds when something, you know, you commit some kind of social faux pas and uh, you have an embarrassment response. So these are the different kind of broad families of emotions. Negative emotions often keep us safe from these physical kinds of threats and, and harm. And positive emotions are very important for um, our social relationships, as I will be talking more about uh, later. So um, we study emotions in, in older adults, sometimes who are um, older adults who are healthy, other times people who have various kinds of neuro, neurodegenerative diseases. And what we try to do is understand how emotions are changing in people as they age, and also how emotions change in relation to brain structure and function. So we can try to associate those differences in emotion that we quantify with different parts of the brain to see how they're working well or maybe less well. And so there's lots of um, different ways that we can do this and um, hypotheses that we might have about how the brain is changing in people who show changes in their behavior or emotions. But this is one very broad framework that you may have heard about, and it's kind of oversimplified, but I do think it's helpful to consider the two hemispheres of the brain. And the left hemisphere is very important for language. And the right hemisphere is very important for nonverbal abilities, including emotion. I'm going to introduce you to one um, network within the right hemisphere that's anchored by the right hemisphere. Um, that we think a lot about. So the networks in the brain are comprised of neurons that are activating and deactivating kind of in synchrony. So they participate in different functions together. And this is the network that participates when you're experiencing a strong emotion. So the anterior insula is shown there in blue and the anterior cingulate and the amygdala, the cingulate is there shown in yellow, are these two kind of key um, sets of regions that anchor this emotion system. This first pathway from the cingulate and the amygdala down to the body triggers those emotional reactions. So when your heart rate speeds up, when your face moves in a very specific way, when you feel fear, your amygdala and your cingulate are telling your body really quickly, change your face, you know, increase your heart rate, change your breathing, maybe make your hands sweat. All of that is organized by those two structures in the brain. And in people who have a loss of tissue in those structures, they don't have those emotional responses in the same way that we, we would expect. So we call this the efferent pathway brain to um, body. There's also an afferent pathway that connects the body back to the brain. And this pathway allows the brain to constantly know and be updated about the internal state of the body. So it's not enough for your brain to tell your heart to go up and your face to move. You also have to know that that's happening so that you can be aware. And, and also humans have the ability to control and regulate. So we have to have this afferent pathway that's constantly telling our brain what's going on in the body. And um, that's the pathway where the insula 
is extremely important for mapping those internal states. So when we talk about things like gut feeling and um, that kind of internal awareness, what you're really doing is tapping into your interior insula. And the cingulate amygdala and the insula are all very, very tightly connected because as you can imagine, the system again has to know what's going out and what's coming in in order to kind of maintain a healthy, um, a healthy emotion system. And we use this system all the time to guide behavior, to make decisions. Um, you're using it without even realizing it, yet, but constantly uh, gauging those internal states of the body. So this is the network that we'll be talking about um, when, when, I'm, when I'm describing the emotions that we measure. Okay, so um, negative emotions, I'm not gonna talk too much about these today, but um, I mentioned that some, some negative emotions uh, are really important for keeping us safe from physical threats and harm. Um, so here's one example, we've been talking about fear. This is what fear looks like in the face. So you might raise your eyebrows, they go up and in, you might uh, stretch your lips, your pupils might get um, dilated and you kind of tense your lower part of your, your eye. And in the autonomic nervous system, what's happening is that the blood flow is changing in different patterns throughout the body. So sometimes people's face kind of go white. Um, the blood is moving maybe from the face down to different body parts. Sometimes people think it goes to the leg in order to run away. Um, there can be, um, again, sweaty hands and sometimes goosebumps. All of that is important to motivate us to take action and deal with that threat. So we take action really quickly when we have that fear response. So the thing about negative emotions is that they should be brief, right? We want to have that response. And then we really want to kind of go back to baseline. Um, so this is our emotional response. That's kind of a helpful response. You want it to be of moderate intensity and you want it to disappear as quickly as possible. Not that too quickly. I don't mean to say that you should avoid your negative emotions. emotions all emotions are helpful and they're telling us information but we don't wanna have a negative emotion forever because if they are sustained or prolonged or really intense, that's when negative emotions become problematic and they can have um, negative effects on physical health and on mental health. So um, one kind of sustained negative emotional state that we can think about and that's really critical to consider in aging is the state of loneliness. And so loneliness can be thought of as a prolonged negative emotional state. People might um, be alone and not have many social relationships, or they may have social relationships, but still feel alone. And that feeling of being alone is the key component to, to loneliness. And so um, this chronic kind of um, lonely state, which can be thought of as a, a different form of a stress stressor, has been associated with lots of poor health outcomes. Again, these aren't just mental health outcomes, but even physical health outcomes. People um, with higher loneliness have um, different cardiovascular risk factors and um, different risks for mort mortality, increased mortality. And so um, when we think about um, how to counteract loneliness or, or other negative emotions that are sustained, such as loneliness, we can think about leveraging positive emotions as kind of the antidote to these negative emotions. So positive emotions are thought to have this undoing effect and bring us back to a homeostatic baseline. Um, and that's why they can be really helpful. It can be happy, it, it can be helpful to um, laugh, you know, and positively think about a situation when, when you're upset. Um, it can be helpful to laugh when you are watching a scary movie. You know, those things are not random. Your body's actually trying to counteract that, that negative emotional state. So um, positive emotions, just like uh, negative emotions, again, are considered to be a family. And we can think of different positive emotions. Again, each one is important, serves a function. So uh, in the field of emotion research, uh, the early studies, which were really you know, not that long ago, probably in the 80s was when the field kind of really began to take, pick up speed. Negative emotions, as you can imagine, were really the hot topic. Everyone studied fear and then discussed, and that was where all the attention was. But over time, people kind of began to realize like, wait a minute, positive emotions are also really interesting. And it's not all just happiness. You know, I think a lot of times people think happiness is one thing. Actually, happiness is probably a term we use um, to refer to lots of different positive states, just like I think stress is a term we refer use to refer to a lot of negative states. But underneath those kind of big umbrella terms, there's these different discrete 
kinds of emotions that are actually interesting and different in the physiology that they're associated with. So positive emotions such as compassion or the love you feel for your children, um, the love you feel for your spouse. Uh, again, emotion we'll talk a lot about, gratitude. These are different positive emotions that have different uh, functions. But one thing that positive emotions are um, share and they, that they have in common is that positive emotions, they don't just feel good. You know, we all like to feel positive, but they help us to approach other people. So positive emotions um, motivate us to form relationships, to meet new, new friends, to share, you know, different stories about your life. Um, when you feel happy and positive, often people want to go out. They want to go to dinner. They want to text their friends. When you feel negative, you don't want to go out. You want to sit at home, you know, watch Netflix and eat ice cream. Like these are your emotions kind of pushing you around in the world in ways that we might not even realize it. When we feel positive emotions, uh, studies have shown people have more ideas. They generate new thoughts. They can come up with more words, new solutions. Um, so the generativity of positive emotions is really helpful. It's very hard to be creative and curious when you're sad and, and lonely, for example. And um, again, all of this is uh, reflecting the activity in your autonomic nervous system. So the, the fight flight kind of response that people think about as being associated with negative emotions is kind of the opposite. It's the tend and befriend, the, the parasympathetic nervous system that's calming um, the body down, slowing breathing and heart rate. So um, awe is the emotion that we'll be um, focusing on most today. Um, so again, awe is a specific kind of positive emotion that's in that family of positive emotions. And awe is a really interesting positive emotion because it arises in um, situations that we don't immediately understand. So when, you're, when you encounter something that's so extraordinary that you can't even take it in and understand what it is, that's when you're experiencing awe. And it can arise in response to what we call perceptual vastness. And what that really means is it could be physical size. It can literally be here, you know, the Grand Canyon. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's huge. It's hard to understand and wrap your head around it. But it can also be in relation to something very, very small. It can be the petals of a flower that are so intricate or such a beautiful color that you can't understand how, you know, anything could have been that intricate um, in nature. Or it could be looking at a cell through a microscope, you know, so it's not just large things, but it's really vast things in a way that, again, make you kind of re, um, we say, accommodate new information and adjust your mental schemas to take in this kind of new information. And so the great thing is, is while you're taking in this new information and kind of readjusting your mind, often people's minds are a little bit more open and um, interested in new things. So the common elicitors of awe are um, things like nature, that's an, a really obvious one, um, but arts and religion are often places where people report experiences of awe. Um, human achievement, you know, the, the um, behavior and gifts and acts of others is another one. So I was gonna show a video here to give you an example of um, some a, a video that depicts odd, just to give you a sense of what I mean of all the different kinds of, some examples of situations.
So that's just one, one clip of a, a video we actually use in some of our studies to elicit awe, but you can feel, you know, watching it, it you feel calm and it's kind of relaxing. Um, it's maybe not as good as being at those places, but it does a good job at, um, at, at getting us into the um, mindset of how we, how we do experience awe. Um, so awe is a great emotion for lots of reasons. Um, uh, here's just some quotes from John Muir, who is a famous um, uh, explorer. And you can see some of the um, examples that he talks about of like walking through nature and just opening your mind and seeing even more. Um, the more you go out, the more you kind of lose yourself in this larger world around you. And that really has to do a lot with the qualities of awe is feeling small in relation to this larger natural world. Um, I mentioned that awe is also helpful for kind of opening our minds and helping us feel curious about the world and creative, thinking about things in new ways. Um, you know, thinking about the mystery of, of the world. And I think this, this tendency is very common in people who do research in science um, and is very motivating to understand the, the world around us in these in incredible ways. So um, when we when we when we talk about awe, what people often describe is this feeling of a small self. And um, what we mean by that is that when we feel um, when we feel awe in these kinds of grand um, situations and in response to these um, different natural environments, for example, we feel small and yet more connected to the world around us. Like we're this small part of this much larger um, puzzle. And it really helps us put things in perspective in our own lives. It's not to say our own problems and, and daily stressors aren't important and significant, but it just kind of shifts your attention outward from yourself and onto this greater world around us and, um, and, and helps us feel part of something larger than oneself. And that's what we mean by the term, the small self. There have been different kinds of studies that have tried to quantify this small self induced by awe. Um, in this study, they brought um, participants to Fisherman's Wharf. This was in San Francisco. And then they had people draw a picture of themselves. And you can maybe see, it might be a little hard to see, but um, uh, this is the size of the person that they drew themselves in this graph paper. They used graph paper so they could quantify exactly how many squares the person used in the drawing of themselves. And then in different participants, they had them go um, to Yosemite, do the same exercise, draw themselves. And you can see now the self is literally much smaller. The person, you know, put them in self in this much larger context, even when just unconsciously drawing a, a picture of themselves. Um, so the small self is um, really important for social interactions and behaviors because, again, it's shifting our attention onto other people and not our ourselves, and therefore our um, attention is drawn to the needs of others and to the collective rather than to our own needs. And so when you induce awe in participants with those videos or um, bringing them to different parts of the UC Berkeley campus, as this study did, um, people are more kind and more helpful when they've elicited awe. This building is not eliciting awe. This is the control condition. But they had participants, students looking up at this kind of um, regular um, Berkeley campus building. And then they brought other students to the um, grove of trees. The, per, uh, the experimenter you know, dropped a bunch of pencils in front of them in a pretend accident, and then they counted how many pencils the participants would help pick up. A very simple kind of intervention, um, but the people who had experienced awe and had stared up into the trees were more helpful and picked up more of the pencils. Um, so you know, little shifts in behavior like that that are induced by awe. Another one, they brought them up to this beautiful, um, the Campanile up on UC Berkeley campus, and they had them look around, um, and then they um, had them make different decisions or write about themselves. And people are just more humble, more generous. They make um, kinder, more generous decisions by giving resources to other people. Once you bring them up to the Campanile and they've looked at this beautiful view and again, feel more connected, feel smaller self, shift their attention outward and wanna kind of participate and help other people. Um, there's some interesting cultural studies that have been done on all. I'll just highlight this one. I don't know if this is hard to see, but I'll tell you that this was done in China and the United States, and they asked people to do um, to write about daily experiences where they experienced awe. And in these pie charts, um, the details aren't that important, but people wrote about you know nature, art and music, architecture, technology as regular things that elicit awe. But the one thing that was really different between the United States and China was that we were 20 times more likely to feel awe about ourselves than 
um, they were in China. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about us, but um, you know, we can experience awe in relation to our own achievements and perhaps Americans uh, are more facile at that. But the feeling is still the same, even though the listeners might, might be different. So there isn't actually that much work that's been done on awe and the brain, but there have been a few studies that have looked um, at the effects of nature in the brain. And often these studies, what they do is they have participants have a brain scan, and then they send them out for a walk. Sometimes they walk in nature, um, and other times they walk through a city. And so this provides like a nice control condition where you can see how the brain changes in response to those um, different kinds of walks. They go back to the brain scanner, they measure their brain again while they're doing some kind of stressful task or some fear-inducing task. And um, they found in general that people who are taking these nature walks have lower sympathetic nervous system reaction, that fight or flight response is lower after their nature walk when they're talking about their daily stressors. And also when they look at the brains and how they're activating, they have lower activity in those two structures that we talked about earlier, the cingulate, anterior cingulate and the amygdala when they're in these stressful conditions. So just having gone on that nature walk reduces your um, brain's activity in response to stressors um, in those same um, two structures that we talked about as really being important for generating emotional responses. So you've kind of you know, uh, soothed your brain and given it a little more buffer to deal with uh, a negative kind of situation after having gone on, on a nature walk. And the physiology of this I think is really interesting, but um, I'll just kind of go over it briefly. And we talked about it earlier when we were talking about the video. So when we, when we, when we experience awe and when we're trying to um, kind of recover from these negative emotional events, what we're really doing is engaging the parasympathetic nervous system. And just so you have a sense of what, how this works, um, with your heart, without your brain kind of being involved, it beats like a metronome. It beats very, very quickly and it beats very, very regularly. And the brain has a, a the vagus nerve goes from the brain down to the heart and the, it inhibits and slows the heart. But the way that it inhibits and, and slows the heart varies across your breathing cycle. So when you breathe in, the vagus, which is like a break on the heart, it releases its break, the heart rate speeds up. And when you breathe out and you exhale, the vagus exerts its break, slows the heart, and the heart rate slows down. And the, across the breathing cycle, there's this kind of jitter in, heart, in the heart rate, which is often called heart rate variability. There's lots and lots of studies or respiratory sinus arrhythmia that link heart rate variability um, to lots of different um, advantageous kinds of health benefits. But this is the system that you're engaging if you're doing yoga or you're meditating or you're watching soothing, you know, um, funny videos. Um, so this is the system that again, you're engaging to slow the heart and counteract stress. Okay, so usually when we try to measure emotions and how much, how strongly people are feeling emotions, what we do is we bring them to our lab at UCSF. It's a very controlled space. Um, we know what the people are looking at. We measure their body. We put sensors on them. We, we quantify how their face is moving um, with videotapes and we ask them lots of questions about how they're feeling. And um, in the study that I'm about to tell you about, we did none of that. And we instead had people live their everyday lives and I had no idea what was going to happen after we saw them in our laboratory and gave them a very brief set of instructions. So in the study that we did on awe and awe walks, we asked the question, can we, can we do a very simple intervention to help increase experiences of awe in, in healthy older adults in, with the goal of really helping them feel more connected to, to others? So here's the brief um, outline of the study that we did. And it was an eight week study and um, we had people complete a bunch of surveys at the beginning and at the end. And then every single day of the eight week study, we emailed them and we asked them to report on their emotional experience that day, all different kinds of negative and positive emotions. How much did they feel them? A few other questions. And um, we also asked everyone in the study to take one, at least one 15 minute walk per week of the study. And so they, um, the, on the days that they took these walks, they filled out additional surveys and questionnaires. And when they went on their walks, we asked them to take selfies during their walks. And they did this for eight weeks. And so we had met them in the lab. We gave them these instructions and we said, goodbye, good luck. And we never saw them again other than on email. So we um, crossed our fingers and hoped for the best. 
So there were two groups in the study and it was a randomized study. So people randomly were assigned to one of two groups. Everyone got the instructions I just told you, um, but the people who were randomly assigned to the awe walk group also got additional instructions. And we taught them about the emotion of awe. So we told them awe uh, is the feeling you have when you're in the presence of vast things you don't immediately understand. It shifts your attention away and helps you appreciate the world around you. We asked them to tap into their childlike sense of wonder and we asked them if possible to go somewhere new on their walks, but they didn't have to, and they could walk anywhere they wanted. It could be a city, it could be the country, it could be the suburbs, anywhere they wanted. And, um, and that was it. And so we followed um, them for the two months of the study. And the people in the control box, again, did the exact same thing, outdoor walks, 15 minutes each week, um, but they just didn't have a, a goal in mind. So the results of the study were that in general, both of the groups took very similar walks. This was important because this was actually a really tight control group. You know, we know walking is good for you. And so we kind of anticipated anyone doing the study might improve and feel some benefits from walking this just a little more often. And um, anything that the all walk group experienced had to be above and beyond just regular walking. And so this is a good illustrator of for me because I never get to see thunder, thunder and lightning. I'll try to <laughs> not be distracted. Um, okay, so so we got thousands of surveys back and um, thousands of um, photographs from people. And yeah, again, in general, both of these groups, the, the walks were very similar. So it was a really good control. Um, people took kind of similar to long the lengths of walks, the distance and speed and um, beauty were the same. They didn't go really different kinds of places. Um, in general, they were very similar. And the first thing we wanted to know was, you know, did people who take the awe walks have experienced more awe than the people who took what we called the control walks? So you'll see in all of these slides, the awe walk group is going to be in green and the control walk group will be in gray. And indeed, the people on the awe walks did report more awe. This was good. This was just a control check. You know, we told them to feel awe. So we were like, okay, phew, the instructions worked and step one, you know, complete. Um, but that wasn't really enough. So the next thing, oh, and here's an example of someone um, of what they said. This was kind of an A plus uh, research participant. They really, really got it. They sent us this photo and I should have mentioned all the photos I'm showing you are from participants that um, what they submitted to us. They wrote the beautiful fall colors and the absence of them amidst the evergreen forest, thought about how the leaves were no longer crunchy underfoot because of the rain and how the walk was more spongy now thought about the wonder that a small child feels as they explore their expanding world. So really, really got it. They have the sensations, they have the colors, they have everything. And so here's where we looked at all the other kinds of um, benefits that the awe walks might have. And you can see that this on the bottom x-axis, it's time, days. And so what we're looking for is these lines to kind of diverge over time. That's how we analyze the data. And um, when the, the lines are going in different directions, you can tell that the groups had different experiences. So here, the green line is going up. People took awe walks, reported feeling part of something larger than themselves more often. They reported being in the presence of vast things. Um, we also wanted to check whether the people who took awe walks um, did experience a, you know, increasing small self. So to do this, what we did was we used all the selfies that people had sent us. And we um, traced the silhouette of the, each person in every photograph. And then we computed the proportion of the photo that was filled with their own image versus the background and gave them a score. And we wanted to know whether the awe walk group over time filled more of their photos with their background, uh, with the background than with themselves. And indeed that is what we found over time, the people on the awe walks kind of moved down into the side. Again, they don't know the theory of the small self. They weren't doing this um, to make us happy, I don't think, but um, they moved down to the side and they filled more of their background, more of the photo with their background. So here's an example of someone who took the control walks. Here's week one. And we get, you know, she's in the middle, no judging of other people's selfies. We all take selfies like this. Um, but here's someone from the AWA group, week one, regular selfie. But why week eight, again, she was kind of moving over, make room for this larger world to make, to shine through in her photograph. Um, so not just awe increased over um, time in the people who took awe walks, but these other pro-social positive emotions, which was kind of like what we were really looking for, also really increased more in the people who took awe walks. These are emotions like admiration, compassion, those other oriented positive emotions. We use the photographs here to, again, kind of find additional evidence for 
these increasing positive states. So here what we did was we coded the intensity of the smiles in people's photographs. And um, over time, the people who took all walks were showing bigger smiles in their photographs um, across the eight weeks um, of the study, offering additional evidence of their increased positive states. So all of that data was from the surveys from the walk, the days they took the walks themselves. Now we looked at the surveys on all those other days, even when they weren't walking, but they were still in those groups. Here we still saw that the people who took all walks had these greater increases in those pro-social positive emotions, even on regular days without a walk, decreases in negative emotions such as distress. And they also felt greater increases in feeling, again, part of something larger than themselves in the presence of vast things and feelings of having a smaller self. We did one final thing, which was we tried to look at whether there was like a dose-like effect, because in a medication study, you know, you always want to know, is more medication better than less medication? And so we tried to assess whether more walks was better. And there was some indication that the people who kind of adhered to the study more and did take more walks did have greater benefits in their pro-social positive emotions. I think, you know, if people stopped doing the walks, these effects wouldn't last, but if it became a practice and over time, I do think it could kind of accumulate. So um, after we published the study, which came out during COVID, which was um, completely not planned, we did the study. It, the study took years to do, and it um, was all completed before COVID. But it came out at a great time for people to, you know, want to hear some positive, positive news. And so we got a lot of good um, press from it, and even uh, got translated into the world of kids, which made me really excited because I think it's not really specific to healthy older people or midlife people. It's a, it's a true fact, I believe, for, for all ages and. Um, if you are on Instagram, you can follow the hashtag all walk and every day I get to see photos from people's all walks really from around the world. And it's, it's really um, fun to see how people have taken this in so many um, different directions. Okay, to sum up, um, this was a really quick behavioral intervention that we did to experience to increase experiences of awe. And one thing about positive emotions is they have this idea of having this upward spiral of well being associated with them so one kind of begets another and when we feel good. We help other people feel good and we also feel more positive emotions ourselves. And I think uh, it's just one kind of easy way that we can all integrate into our, in our daily lives to help um, begin to um, increase our own upward spiral of well-being. And um, by introducing creative practices and other additional elaborations on experiences of awe, I think we can even increase the benefits even more. So if you're interested in the um, paper, I'm happy to send it out or it's on my lab webpage and the exact instructions that we gave people are also on a handout that you can um, download. And to close, I'd just like to acknowledge all my um, collaborators who helped me do this work. Dacher Keltner is a professor at UC Berkeley who's really a leader in the study of awe and positive emotions. And he was um, the senior author on our, on our work and my colleagues at UCSF and San Francisco State University. And the, the work was funded by the Global Brain Health Institute here, you can see. And what that is, is a um, interdisciplinary fellowship training program that we have at UCSF in partnership with Trinity College in Dublin. And GBHI, as it is known, is a really interesting kind of experience for people who are interested in brain health equity broadly defined. And I'm happy to talk more about that because it's a kind of new concept. But it brings together people from um, science and the arts to train together to think about new ways to promote brain health. And so in that context, I had the fortune of meeting uh, Dr. Jenny Gubner and working with her and other um, artists and um, creative, uh, all sorts of people from the creative, creative backgrounds in thinking about how we can improve brain health by integrating art and science in novel ways. And I'm gonna pass the mic back to Jenny where she's gonna tell you some really exciting work that she's been working on to uh, build on the study that I just told you about. So thank you. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, so this funny fellowship that I was a part of, um, I think really what they hope to do is to bring people together to think in new ways. And although my primary research is not about awe, when I learned about um, Dr. Sturm's work, I got so excited about it that I started thinking about how I might be able to do a side project, thinking about how as an artist, um, I might bring something to her work and think about how to share that work um, with the public coming from the perspective of arts and creativity. So I'm an ethnomusicologist, which is like a musical anthropologist. 
and I'm a chair of a program here called the Applied Intercultural Arts Research Graduate Interdisciplinary Program, which is a mouthful. But what this program is trying to do is to think about how we can use the arts to address social issues in our communities and our world, and to do so in collaboration and conversation with other disciplines and scholars in other disciplines. And so this project that we that I've created, um, you know, inspired by Dr. Sturm and in collaboration with one of my doctoral students, Sydney Strative, I think is a good example of what we're trying to build in this program. When I read um, Virginia's work um, uh, and saw this article and, start, and saw the social media response, I just started thinking like, how is that that arts perspectives um, might bring something? How, what is an art scholar? What could an art scholar bring to these conversations about awe walking? I had learned from her that art also inspires awe. You know, so if art inspires awe and awe walking, people are using these artistic ways to talk about awe walking, what could we do to sort of dig deeper into that and to help each other get more connected um, of, around awe walking, but using my skills and background and training um, as, an, as an artist and an art scholar. So Sydney and I have worked for the last two years. We started during COVID right when this came out thinking about doing different studies, first on ourselves, sort of tryouts, and then inviting other people into the collaboration. I was part of a big EU um, research study about arts, um, ethnography, anthropology, and pedagogy, and thinking how might we ask other people around the world to think about arts and awe walking and how we can do this work. We published something on an arts um, research platform in London called Arts Cabinet that talks about the results of those first, um, you know, those explorations that we did. The first thing that we did, when she and I, when Sydney and I started working together is we started thinking about themes. What if you went on awe walks looking for specific themes? You know, instead of just looking for awe generally, could we hone in and could we help people hone in by thinking of creative, you know, what are all the different ways that we experience awe here in the Southwest and then send people out to look for those. So we went on light walks. At the top, you can see photos of a light walk I took um, here in Tucson. And the bottom is another light walk that we took when we brought this work to South by Southwest, the big festival in Austin, Texas in the spring. Then we went on color walks. You know, what happens if you go out looking for color or what happens if you go out looking for a specific color, you know, all the greens. The top is me looking for greens in the desert. And when I started the walk, I thought, oh, I'm not gonna find anything green. And by the end of the walk, I realized there's so many greens, you know, so many different variations of green. And that was in and of itself really awe-inspiring to me. And then putting them together and thinking about creating these creative displays of a collage that I could then share was exciting. The same down below, another awe walk from Austin. We looked at texture, which was another way, you know, another great thing to hone in on, looking close into things about all the different textures that we can find. And we realized that these themes were really fun. It was fun for us, it was fun for others, and there's many other themes um, that we can look for. And so that, that was sort of lesson one that we learned. Then we started thinking, well, what if we turned art into, or awe uh, into art? And so we sent people out to start looking for, you know, using your, not just taking a photo, but thinking about photography as a creative, um, process or taking a, making a sketch of something that you see when you're out writing a poem about something that you see or maybe taking a photo coming home and then turning that into a sketch or a poem and we started seeing again people really enjoying this process of sort of further digesting their awe by sitting with it as they engage with creativity we did all of this on um using different platforms, things like WhatsApp, you know, um, and different sharing platforms to get people together. And we saw that people really loved connecting. I mean, as Dr. Stern was talking about this idea of really wanting to share awe with others, you know, and then getting that kickback feeling when people enjoy seeing your awe. Um, and so that was something we really saw as well as seeing that beyond the themes we gave people, people started these awe conversations. You know, you have a kumquat that then someone, someone else in the world shares an orange, shares a lemon, someone shares a ring around the moon. And all of a sudden you have these sort of things, this game of awe telephone of things that inspire each other. And so in light of all that, we, we realized like, well, how could we create more sharing and, and more of a way of honing in on these themes and these modalities? And we couldn't quite find the right platform that everybody was using. Um, not everyone was on Instagram, not everyone was on WhatsApp. So we decided to make our own website. Um, thanks to funding from the Innovations in Healthy Aging Initiative, We've been working with the Center for Digital Humanities here all year, and I'm super excited to say that today, today, the website has gone live. So I invite you all um, to visit it. It's awe.arizona.edu. There's still some things that we're working on um, that we'll be working out, you know, in the, the glitches in the next um, few days. But we made this website as a place to invite you all to share awe um, and to have these awe conversations with each other.
The website is simple. There's a gallery where you can share experiences of awe with one another. And there's a map where we can map awe so that we can actually find places in and beyond Tucson to encourage you to get out and explore places you haven't been and to share things with each other. So there's the gallery, there's the map, and there's this very simple upload form where we ask you to think about what is the, what modality, is this a sketch, is this a photograph, is this, um, what, what themes did you follow, if any, was it color, is it green, is it a texture, is it a pattern, um, and so we invite you to sort of fill this out and then submit that as a way for us to start talking to each other and, and engaging in these awe conversations. As part of building this website, we wanted to really bring this to the university and encourage students and community members to engage in our walking. And so we created also a workshop series that's starting this weekend called the Creative Encounters in Our Walking Workshop Series. Um, and I'll have Sydney um, talk for a little bit, introducing you to the four workshops that are coming up, and we would love to have you participate in those. Thank you very much. Hello, we're so excited to launch this workshop series this weekend. What we've done is we've combined a theme, a modality, and a Tucson partner. So each of the workshops will be looking at something different. This Saturday, we're going to be at the Center of Creative Photography looking at light and landscape photographers. In October, we're going to the Miniature Museum. We're going to make fairy doors and talk about how to find awe in small things. In November, we are going to Sweetwater Reserve and we're going to partner with the Tucson Audubon Society and talk about sound walks and how you can tap into sound as you're walking in your own neighborhoods. And then December, we'll be at the Botanical Gardens and we're learning about how to create botanical illustrations and how to pair those two together. And there's a lot more I can go into, but I really invite you to come visit our table and learn more about the All Walk series and look forward to having you. I think our goal in all of this is to try to give you all um, a toolkit and sort of um, ways that you can tune into awe in different ways. It doesn't mean if you go on a color walk, you can't see a beautiful uh, shape. <laughs> it just means to sort of give you these little micro exercises, creative artistic exercises that can then help you develop this practice and integrate it into your lives. So with that said, um, thank you so much. And we will now open up the floor and I'll bring Dr. Stern back up and we can ask her some questions before the reception. Thanks again. Yes, sir. Oh, I hope I don't embarrass myself. <laughs> okay, but uh, I, this is all good. Okay, like it's all, but I'm seeing a lot of external stimulation, right? And it, the goal is to get us out and amongst in, in nature and amongst ourselves and everything and getting outside of ourselves. But coming out of COVID and coming out of, you know, some people that are maybe incarcerated or in situations where they they don't have that, you know, the, the, the ability to have that external, external awe can in this if it's a stupid question you know just embarrassing <laughs> can you can, can the mind create its own awe okay and, internally and and yeah that is this yeah that's a no it's not a stupid question it's a great question um i think so i mean i think there is um normal variation in how awe prone people are so some of us feel awe really easily other people, it's harder to feel awe. And I've definitely spoken to people who are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't feel that way. Um, so there's normal variability, but I think, you know, you can find awe in your mind, you know, honestly, like thinking of, I thought about it on the plane when I was flying down here, I was like, how does a plane work? I don't really understand it deeply enough to understand how humans created this, you know, or my computer. I think about it all the time when I'm on Zoom. I'm like, how is this possible? So there are um, ways I think that we can let our minds just wander into thinking about the world around us without going there. Yeah. You'll follow up. Yeah. Okay. So, so the other question was, is the endor are you get endorphins from this stuff? I mean, is that, yeah. is that the, I mean, from the physical exercise, you get that, right? right. I mean, from go doing the walking and stuff like that, is that, is that the, the goal is to get the, 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 the pleasure? Of yeah. The I mean, I think the, the pleasure, the feeling of pleasure or positive experience comes probably from endorphins. I, I don't know if anyone's tested that with awe exactly, but that, 
the calm state in the body is very tightly connected with that feeling of positive experience. So I think when you're breathing deeply, when your heart rate is slow, when you are enjoying something in the world around you, then all of that is generally good for the body. Um, and so endorphins are one part of it, but it's like that quiet kind of internal state that is the opposite of a stress, you know, kind of, um, response. Yeah. And I'm not a neuroscientist, so I hope I don't say something stupid, but I would think that, um, also really thinking about the arts in that situation, that's a great place to engage with off. You think about incarcerated populations, um, and listening to music, or you think about folks that are bed bound and what music or art making or drawing or sketching, you know? So I think that that that's where those creative practices again, can come back in, in, in ways that we can experience awe, I think quite greatly, but without leaving our, you know, our rooms. I'm Maggie Pitts. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. I do research on communication and savoring or savoring and social interaction. And I have two questions for you. One is, could you address the developmental notion of awe? So as we age across the lifespan, where are the peak moments where we develop awe? Um, thinking about different Group. So childhood, I noticed that, you know, that wonder of childhood, but what about the teenage years and then um, middle age years and of course, adulthood and older adulthood. And then my other question is, can you talk about that? Um, can you talk about the connection between savoring and awe? And have you looked into some of those, um, some of those connections there? Thank you. Yeah, two really good questions. Um, so I don't think I know the answer to either question, but I can try. Um, so in terms of development, I'm really, I think it's a really interesting question because we all know that kids are very imaginative and um, probably like the word awe isn't a common word that kids know. You know, I have kids, they didn't really know that word. And um, we test kids in our lab and we ask them to define all these words and awe is definitely one I know that a lot of younger kids like at least age seven and up like don't always know um, but they know like wonder and they know the the general idea so but words aren't the same as the emotion I would argue exactly so whether they've learned that vocabulary word doesn't necessarily mean they can't feel awe um, so I don't know of any developmental studies of awe I mean it depends how you define it, right? So if you defined it by knowledge of words, then I would say, sure, like there's a developmental trajectory and probably young kids, you know, don't have that word knowledge, but most emotions we think are present, you know, from early childhood, like the self-conscious emotions I, I mentioned, we often think of those as kind of developing later than things like fear or sadness, you know, infants will cry immediately um, after they're born, as we know. Um, but I don't know of anyone who's looked at off per se, but we are, we are starting to do a little bit of that in some of our work with kids and, and linking it to imagination, because if you have high awe, I would imagine you have a good creativity and, you know, imagination. So I guess TBD um, on that one. And then savoring, I mean, so savoring by just so everyone, we're all on the same page, you mean by um, intentionally prolonging or looking to extend positive experiences. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so again, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that, but I, I think that we're probably talking about overlapping concepts, you know what I mean? Because positive states often kind of, I do think they linger more than a, like a negative state. And it might be that we aren't trying to stop a positive state, right? Like if I'm really nervous, I want to stop being really nervous and I'll do things to stop that. But if I'm like in a good mood, I don't, why would I stop that? Right. You want to keep that going. So in that sense, I, I think positive emotions are inherently savored probably by all of us. Um, but again, I would go to the art and the arts as a way to savor, right? Like if you have a experience of awe on a walk, you can extend it by talking about it and sharing it and drawing it. And, you know, is that what you're going to say? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we found that, you know, when Sydney and I asked people to go out and find something, you know, really focus on the walk, but then bring something home. And then over the next week, turn that thing into an art project. 
um, we found that that was the response that we got. I mean, a few people got scared and, you know, went into this, I'm not an artist and I'm self-critical, but when we reframe the question as like, please forget about that and just draw like a child or, you know, make it about the process and not the product. People said, oh, it was so great to just like go back and then just really savor in that moment of awe. And so I think that's one example. I was also just going to say that I think the first thing that my daughter learned to say was, wow, you know, and like, I've learned more about awe from her as she's a year and a half, but you know, really, honestly, you see that, that, wow, you know, to just oh, things that inspired her. So I, I feel like the awe is definitely there. It's great. Great anecdote. Yeah. Anissa. Thank you. We have a question from a virtual audience member. Um, the question is, how does this relate to people maybe in nursing homes? Um, I, I mean, I think that, um, awe can benefit all people wherever they are. Um, maybe in nursing homes, I would hope that there's awe, but maybe there's not enough awe. Um, but as we kind of talked about I, any health condition, uh, brain condition, physical condition can be worsened by negative states, you know, like sadness or loneliness. Um, so, awe is like one of these kind of relatively simple things to increase in all of our lives. So in that, in that context, I would imagine that awe could also have beneficial effects. I mean, it's not going to cure things, right, but it's going to improve well-being, help people feel more connected. And those do have important implications for physical mental health. Yeah. Can I, could I add something to that? Oh, sorry. I just was going to say that I, you know, I've worked in, um, done work in a lot of different assisted living facilities and memory care facilities. And I think, um, I've had the privilege of seeing some really amazing places that have thought about how to implement, uh, awe inspiring activities into day-to-day -day care. You know, I mean, I'm thinking of one place I worked that had a chicken coop, um, that had a, a wheelchair accessible ramp that you could go out in the morning and get eggs. You know, I mean, it was something simple, but that, that can be really awe inspiring and beautiful to get out and, you know, and find things or a place that worked on doing a field trip where they took um, people out fishing to the river, you know, and back. And so whether it's something that's an activity going somewhere or actually, or painting a mural, you know, in, inside a facility or thinking about just what kind of reading materials or listening materials or art materials are being be made accessible to people. I think there's all different ways that you can go about that kind of going back to the question of incarcerated folks um, without having to really think about, you know, getting out and walking around your neighborhood. Yeah, I think it's a perspective, you know, like um, during COVID, my husband started telling me about this hummingbird in our backyard that, you know, he's not like a bird watcher. And suddenly every day I got this hummingbird update and it was always there, right? I'm sure the hummingbird wasn't new, but he didn't have the time or the place to notice it. And so it was right in front of our noses, literally. And you just have to shift outward and not, you know, we all constantly thinking about all the things we have to do and all that, whatever. But if you shift outward and just notice it, often it's right there. So it's probably true in any context. Yeah. When I started doing this work, I remember calling Virginia and saying like, well, what if someone, if someone wants to go on an op bike ride, does that, you know, does that count? Or what if they're running or what if they, you know, and she was saying that that's not, it doesn't, the walk is just a way of, it's just an exercise, you know? So really it's the act of looking outward um, that matters in whatever capacity you're doing. So Aw swims. I got a lot of questions about aw swims. Yes, sure. Aw swim. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Was there another question? Oh. Yes. There's a, there's a mic coming your way. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just thinking about this and the question from the gentleman over there. And there was a time in my life, long, long time ago, but I was really unhappy, you know. And someone said um, to me, just find one beautiful thing just one thing each day. And you're like, oh, I can't do that. But I think these situations that you're talking about, do I really need this? Um, <laughs> they, what we, what we need are people in the nursing homes or parents or teachers to remind us to notice that, you know, there's so much going on to make us stop and find that one thing or to ask that person, 
what's the one thing you found today that was beautiful? And you don't have to take a long walk or do all that. Just that one thing, whether it's a child smiling or running down the hall or whatever. And I think that, that reminding people, that's all. Yes, totally agree. Thank you. And I think that's what we were hoping, you know, in building these sharing groups, that's what we saw is that people would say to us, you know, if it wasn't for the group, I probably would have forgotten to go on the walk, but because it was popping up on your phone, you know, and we have to think about how that translates to this website we've built. But if you make a habit of checking out the website and then seeing what other people are doing, it might push you to think, you know, or this idea of sort of weekly themes. If we have a, maybe we'll have an email listserv where you can get a theme, you know, every Monday that just says like this week, look for this, you know, and that that can encourage you because without that accountability, you know, I think life does take over all the time and it, and, and it is something that, the, and the more you practice it, the more it becomes, um, but the more you, I mean, you taught me this, Virginia, the more are you feel, the more you find, right. And it, it sort of multiplies. So that's, you know, if you can get into the habit, just like exercising, then it's not as hard to sustain. Any other questions? Yes. One last question. So I'm a creative writing student focusing in poetry here at the O of A, and when we write poetry, we're asked to create things that inspire joy. So my question is, is there a psychological difference between joy and awe or a connection maybe? Yeah, I think they're definitely connected. I mean, we would think of them as two different emotions, positive emotions. So they're in that family of shared, they have some shared components, like they feel, they feel good. And we want to, we want to feel both of them, but, um, yeah, awe has the more outward focus kind of social component where joy can be pure, you know, pleasure and enjoyment, um, of whatever, whatever thing in life. So one can, you know, foster the other, I think, but awe has a slightly different, um, behavior that it, motivates. And so that's what we really think of as emotions as doing is motivating actions. So it's not just the feeling, like we all feel things, but what we do with them in response to that feeling is the key. So I guess that's how I would separate the two. All right. Well, thank you again, all of you for being here. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Stern, for flying down to be with us. Uh, we now have a reception, so we invite you to come to the reception. There's also some tables with different projects that are um, going on at the university um, related to healthy aging. Um, and again, we have our table. If anyone would like to join us on, on Saturday, we would be very excited um, to, to see you and to talk to you and to, to invite you into this project we're building. But um, please allow me uh, to invite you to thank one more time, Dr. Stern, for being here. Um, thank you.